Hey, what's up, little world? How, how are y'all doing today? Just got in from work. We got a great show for y'all today. This is the 78th episode of the In Your Face show. And I'm here with my main man, Michael Bailey Smith. Introduce yourself, my brother. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor, for sure. Uh, you're welcome, brother. You're welcome. Always, always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm always honored when I'm invited or people think highly enough of me to invite them, invite me on their show. So thank you. Not a problem. Not a problem. You know, just have to, yeah, just speak it to existence. Let's, you know, just go how you feel, you know? You know what I mean? Just, Sounds good. If, yeah, you got to make some moves. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> so, so tell us about yourself, brother. Yeah, so I've been an actor in Hollywood for almost 30 years. Uh, I've been very blessed in, in what I've done. Uh, I've done like 60-some-odd films and about 100 episodes of television, uh, commercials, ta- all types of commercials, uh, video games, voiceover i've done theater so i just been uh run the whole gamut you know as towards being in front of camera and playing different types of characters you know everything from monsters to you know i've done tons of sitcoms uh playing my you know without prosthetics with prosthetics all those things like that i've uh been fortunate enough to have won some awards which is kind of cool um which I always think is very strange that people think that I did a good enough, enough job to get an award. It seems kind of foreign to me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still uh, doing it. Um, I'm now in a different phase of my career. I've been writing twi- quite, uh, quite a bit. I've written a, t- a bunch of screenplays and just recently I had one that was optioned. So it's going to go into production uh, the whole, in t- 2023. That's the goal. And so, yeah, uh, and I wrote it with nothing with, with me not in mind of being in the movie. It just I wanted to write a, a movie. Uh, so, how I come up with this idea was, uh, you know, before acting and things like that, I, you know, I spent my time in high school, in the Middle East. My dad was in the Air Force, and uh, I was an Air Force brat. We traveled all around. I don't really have a hometown. And uh, we only stayed a few years at, at a time. And I ended up in well, high school uh, in Iran. So I'm an old dude, uh, you know, probably much, much older than you are or everybody else out there listening. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, hey, you're so, just getting younger. You're just getting younger. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I plan on living to like I'm 80 or 90. So I haven't, you know, I have a lot more years to go yet. So, but um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I, I've always wanted to play college football was my goal. And, uh, and when I lived in Iran, there's really no one going to scout you to, you know, no recruiters and things like that. So, and coming uh, from a family of six kids and living, you know, my dad being in the air force and, you know, they definitely, they make enough money to survive and things like that and support your family, but not enough to send kids off to college. So, you know, I thought to myself, how am I going to get there? How am I going to, achieve this dream or this goal of wanting to play college football. And so when I graduated high school, I was 160, 160 pounds. So I was very skinny. So I went into the military and I joined the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper in the Army. And I did that for three years. And so from, I joined in May of 1970, no, uh, 77. I graduated in 76. Um, so 77, I, I joined, uh, I went in and weighed 106, 460 pounds. I got out in three years weighing 240. So I busted my butt in the gym and uh, and just ate. You know, those Joe, old Joe Weeder crash weight gain, uh, like paint cans. I used to go through that mm-hmm. a week. Just pound oh, that wow. stuff and all that good army food. Um, I put on a lot of muscle. And, and there was a guy that used to time me, a friend of mine, still a friend to this day. He had a stopwatch. And so... I'd be out there in the field on the parade ground running 40s and see how I got fast as I got was four nine 
this is 19, you know, in the 1970s. So 6'4", 240, ran a 4'9", which is, you know, it's okay. But uh, I had a chaplain in my unit who played at Kansas State. He was an All-American. Uh, and before he went to seminary school, he, he's, he was a badass dude. Biggest chaplain, preacher dude you ever seen. About 6'3", 250 pounds, just arms and big old chest and smoking, drinking, cussing chaplain, man. He was a badass guy. And he heard that I wanted to play college football. And he had put other guys, you know, into college that wanted to play. And so uh, I don't know if you know a guy named Terry Long. He uh, uh, He's a guy that I was in the military with. He was an A-2nd Airborne too. He ended up going, he went to uh, East Carolina. He's about 5'11", 275 pounds, ran 40 and 4'5". Crazy fast. Um, thick dude, huge. And he went to East Carolina and went up with the Pittsburgh Steelers and played for many years. Uh, he was a guard for them, Terry Long. Uh, did really well. And then uh, end up, uh, he got CTE and ended up killing himself. But uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, for me, you know, I uh, I had a chance to go to Notre Dame. and uh, But I chose Eastern Michigan because uh, I'm from Michigan and they needed help. And so that's where I walked on at, uh, and uh, and I was it was a funny story. I'm standing in the the hallway at Eastern Michigan, ready to go and tell the head coach that I want to play tight end and defensive end because that's what I played in high school. Oh wow! And, and then the uh, O line coach walks by and he goes, "Hey, you that paratrooper?" And I said, "Yes, sir." He goes, "I need a center. You want to play center? I'll play anything, sir." All right, go in there and tell him you want, you want to play center, and that's how I started. So I was 6'4", 240 pounds, playing center, and uh, I got redshirted in my freshman year. And then I started. They moved me to guard, and I remember we playing as Illinois. I got my ass kicked. Oh my gosh, did they ever? But you know, and uh, I don't know if you know this. You know, if you played any ball at all, but when you're not very good, a lot of times you talk a lot of smack because that's all you can do. And then, but as you get better. <laughs> <laughs> but as you get better, you don't need to talk smack anymore, right? It's like the Ferrari driving down the road and you go up against a Toyota. The Ferrari doesn't need to race anybody, right? They just drive down the road knowing they can beat beat you. And the, but the Toyota is trying to race, revving its engine, trying to race everything, right? And that's that's how you, if you're really good, you don't need to really talk smack. You just go and crush dudes. And so as I got older, you know, and then I became, went from freshman to, you know, uh, sophomore, I got bigger, I got faster. By the time I was a junior, uh, I had, they had a, I was in my red shirt junior year. I had a, they had a, a, a little a pro day and I could have went and they were looking at me for the NFL. And, uh, and so I, um, I went out there and ran 40 and four, eight weighing two ninety. So back in, back in the early eighties, that's unheard of. That was, that's holy crap fast. Mm. And, and so, uh, that put me on the radar and then I had ever, a lot, tons of teams, all over the NFL, you know, contacting me and things like that. So I went into my senior year, uh, hurt my knee. And uh, so when I finished the season, I had, I had my knee operated on. And uh, when the draft came, I was supposed to go between the third and fourth round. Never happened. And so, but the moment the draft is over, bam, 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 knock on my apartment door. And there is a scout from the uh, – Dallas Cowboys. He goes, you've been signed yet. I said, no, he goes, we want to sign you for the, you know, for the, you know, come play with us. So signed the contract and uh, went to minicamp, went to camp in thousand Oaks and uh, was doing pretty well. Uh, then I blew my knee out and that was it. That was the end of my career. Um, oh, man. So, yeah. So I went from there to went back, finished my degree uh, and then uh, chased some girl out to California. And this is a, uh, 1989 by this time so and uh that relationship lasted about a month and uh uh yeah it was pretty uh it's funny she, <laughs> she dumped me for a bald guy and i had hair back then I was kind of, <laughs> so i'm like what the hell so but wow. anyway uh but the great thing about it i think a lot of things things happen for a reason right and so i end up training with this guy named steve henenberry great guy he ended up being one of the American Gladiators back in the 90s. You probably remember that TV show. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, so he played Conan the Barbarian up in Universal Studios on the live action shows. And he said, uh, hey, I'm going up to Los Angeles to go read for this in, in Hollywood, to read for this movie called Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, playing a bigger version of Freddy Krueger called Super Freddy. 
why don't you come with me? Maybe you can audition and then we'll go to Gold's Gym in, in, uh, uh, in Venice. And let me, I'm going to show you a picture of what I, let me go real quick. Hold on. I'm going to show you this picture. I think you pick it up here. I'll find it real quick for you. Um, this is, this is what I look like uh, before I went to the Dallas Cowboys. If I find a picture of it. You know, actually, Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys is my favorite team. Really? <laughs> yeah, I love them. So I have a Randy White story. So uh, my locker was right across from Randy White's locker. And on his, on his locker, it says, rookies, don't fuck with my shit. So right next to me is Crawford Kerr, who's a second-round draft pick. And I'm a free agent, right? So you know how that goes. Free agents got to mind their own business. Guys are second round. They're pretty much going to make the team, right? Because they paid them enough money. They're not going to cut them. But me, they, if I look wrong or if I sneeze incorrectly, they're going to cut me in two seconds. So he goes, hey, Smith, go over there and uh, check out uh, White's locker. I said, see that? I said, dude, I can read. It says, rookies, don't fuck with my shit. I'm not messing with Randy White's locker. And anyway, um, let me show you this picture. Let's see this. Can you see that? Oh, right man, he was a big guy. Yeah, that's, that's 6'4", 290 pounds. And I had about 9% body fat. So that was right before the Cowboys. So I looked like that when um, – so anyway, too much until tell Randy White's story. So anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, so he goes, screw that. I'm going to go look at it. So he goes over there, and he pulls back the, 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 the sign on his locker – and he looks inside. And he goes, "Holy shit!" There's this picture of his, of his girlfriend. And we heard that he had his date in like Miss Texas or something like that. I don't know, some hot chick. And he goes, you, "You come over and look at it." I said, "No, I don't do it." He, goes, he started calling me a pussy and things like that. Come on! And then I, I'm like, so I of course bent to peer pressure. I went over there, looked at the locker, and it was not a picture of his girlfriend. It was a picture of his dog. It wasn't even it wasn't even the girl, and I turned and there's Randy White coming down the locker hallway, going, "Don't you read, boy?" You know, he had the freaking he was in my face, and then he asked me uh, what position I play, and I told him uh, play guard and center, and uh, he goes, "All right, I'll see you on the football field." So I remember we were out there in uh, this is in Thousand Oaks, so we were out going out there, and after we warmed up, they did O and D one on ones, and we were doing we were in. Uh, shorts and uh and shoulder pads and uh he like right to bat pointed right at me you know come here come here and like this he wanted me right to back oh rook let's go you know i lined up the first first play you know they move the ball and he clubs me upside the head and just crushes me and smashes the quarterback and like you know i had the coaches in my face and screaming at me and yelling at me you want to be on this team you better do better now da, da, da. I got back in the, you know, back in the, 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 you know, back in the back, you know, with everybody else. All of a sudden I look and there's Randy White still pointing at me. Oh man. So I get up there again. This time I'm a little pissed. So when I was in college, I used to work out with this guy who's a martial arts dude. And so what he would, and I know I, and so he would show, he showed me this one technique that I use sometimes in college. So when you pass block, you get up, right. And I'm, I'm hitting it. I hit a guy in the chest and I'll take a real I'll, right here and I'll take a quick shot up here and pop that dude right in the neck right here and then move my hand down and that'll stop a dude in two seconds. You hit a guy hard enough here, he's going to stop. So I tried that on Randy White. Well, that didn't work too well. So then it started to a huge brawl. And, and so from that day to the day I left, I, we fought every day. So it was pretty fun. <laughs> but wow. Man. My Randy White story. So, but then I blew my knee out and ended up going, but anyway, so back to the thing. So I, you know, I was working at Xerox debugging software in San Diego. I hated this job as a cubicle job. I'm not a cubicle guy. I respect anybody that can do eight hours in a cubicle and go home. I, I can't do that. And so um, I uh, I asked my boss, might I take off from work? And she says, no. I said, well, I'm taking it off anyway. And she goes, well, you'll be fired. I said, okay, that's fine. So I, uh, so I, they, they fired me and I got in the car the next day and I drove up to Los Angeles with my buddy and we went to Hollywood and Vine. You can't get more Hollywood than that. And we went into this audition and uh, uh, he went to audition. And then I was sitting there waiting and then they asked me if I wanted to audition. And I went in and it was this 
guy named this guy named uh, the director was uh, Stephen Hopkins, who turned out being a pretty well known director after this movie. And he asked me if I can laugh like Freddy Krueger, and I said. I've seen some movies. Let's see. So I let out this big laugh and he goes, that's fucking awesome. Guess what? You got yourself a job. And so that's kind of how it happened. I got my first role almost by accident. And I got to meet Robert England. I got to set, got on the set. I got my first couple lines. I got my SAG card and I was very blessed and I was scared shitless. But I'll tell you one thing. When I got in front of that camera and they called action, that is the best feeling in the world. So awesome. And that's how it started. And I said, this is what I want to do. So I got, so I was in San Diego and I, and uh, I had a shitty apartment there. And I went, I drove up to Los Angeles and I found this, I slept in my car for about a week or so and uh, found an apartment. And then with some creepy dude slept on the floor in the back room and just got a, I got a job instead of waiting tables. Like most actors, I got a job at a test laboratory, putting my degree to work uh, for consumer products. And, uh, Every, every bit of the money that I spent, every money, money I made at the job, I spent on acting classes. And I studied my ass off every freaking day. Four days, five days a week, I was taking acting classes. Because I treated it like a job. I treat, it's an opportunity, right? So I wanted to, I wanted to be on my mirror in my, uh, my bathroom in my shitty apartment was this sign I, I – scribbled on a piece of paper said michael bailey smith hollywood's new leading man that's what i wanted to be didn't turn out to be a leading man i'm a working actor you know and i play bad guys which i'm really like doing but well, it's just motivation right so mm -hmm. uh, i always tell these people i tell people that want to talk to me about you know how'd you make it things like that and i say listen dude i say I say, listen, dreams will, will stay dreams until you put a plan together to accomplish those dreams. So like my girlfriend right now, uh, that's one on the wall right there. She's she's an inventor, a great, great gal. Uh, her name's Paige. And she she has a invented this incredible thing, got a patent for it. Um, she like I did a percentage of how many people out there in the world have patents. Point zero 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 seven percent of the people in the world have patents. So she's pretty rare. But I told her that your dream of having a company and, and selling this is going to stay a dream unless you every day put a plan together. And every day, no matter how big or small, you work towards that dream. You do something towards that dream, whatever it is, just do it. And that's what I did as an actor. And every day I, I worked at I I also hustled my ass off because back in the day in the 90s. Um, so like how the act uh, in Hollywood, how the this whole thing works is that you'll have a movie who hires a casting director, they'll look at the script and say, okay, we, we need these types of characters, these type of roles, and they'll create a thing called a breakdown. And that breakdown is like, okay, say the movie is called, uh, I don't know, My Good Boy. That's like the script I wrote. It's going to go into production. It's called My mm -hmm. Good Boy. And so they'll break down all the roles for that, and they'll do the scriptures of them, and they'll send it out to all the to all the agents in Hollywood. And the agents will look at their, cast uh, their, their client list and say, oh, you know, Michael's really great for this one role. And then they'll they'll submit my picture along with the, a bunch of other actors they have as that's called a submission and then a submission package. And then back in the day in, in the in the early 90s, they would have somebody deliver those. Right. Now it's all done electronically. Back in the day, someone had to, you know, either hire a service or get one actor to go and drive in their car and drive around all of Hollywood and North Hollywood and everywhere else to deliver these to the casting directors. Guess what I was doing? Every morning at seven o'clock in the morning before I went to work, I was hustling. I, I got my car and I drove all over Hollywood, all over North Hollywood, delivering these submissions to casting directors. This is what I did every freaking morning. Is what wow. I did. So and I didn't. And so you had to hustle, right? So that's what I did, and mm. I started doing that. And then the acting classes started paying off. Because I got lucky with the first role, right? So, but I didn't know how to act. I didn't know the process. I didn't know how to audition and things like that. So I had to learn all this stuff. Right. And then after you start getting it, and guess what? I started landing some stuff and landing more stuff. And then the second role that I got, I did a movie called CIA Codename Alexa with O.J. Simpson was in it before he killed his wife. Well, supposedly he killed his wife. <laughs> you don't know yet. Well, he's not in <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah. you got O.J. Simpson, you had Kathleen Kim and Lorenzo Lamas. So I that role, this is the beauty of Hollywood. 
so I'm I'm in this movie. <laughs> I know. So I'm in this movie, and uh, <laughs> um, oh shit, in this movie, and the director goes, "Hey, um, uh, say a couple lines." So I said a couple lines. He goes, "You're pretty good." Next thing you know, they wrote me. They wrote me a bunch of dialogue. I'm the fourth lead in the film. I went from being an actor just doing a fight scene to being the fourth lead in the film. Oh this wow, Hollywood. And so this is how this thing started. From there, I did a movie called. I did a movie called uh, The Fantastic Four, the original Fantastic Four. I did that. I played Ben Grimm, the thing. It's Clarkman time. I, mean, I did play that guy. Um, and then I did tons of, I did my first sitcom was Murphy Brown. I played a crazy or crazy secretary. I did Family Matters. I got to fight Urkel, which was awesome. He beat, he beat you know, beat me up. Uh, he actually punched me in the balls once during the filming of that, which was very fun. But anyway, but I, I, I have a claim to fame that I got beat up by Urkel. You can't, you can't beat <laughs> So um, and had tons of sitcoms and everything, and just the, the role, the role just and the career just kept going. But I took it seriously, right? And that's what I did. So oh that's kind of how this whole thing started. So I have a I have a question, right? I'm ready. So when you was doing all of this, right? Was it like what was it like during the time of you doing all of this? It was great, um, but you're you know it's like. I'll draw the analogy to like your first day on the job, right? You or like when you're when you're you're going to like uh, interview for a job, you have no idea what the job's going to be like, right? You just don't. Mm -hmm. but you want to you want to get in it, but then once you then like the first couple of days on the job, you're excited. It's still new. You're trying to learn how to do things, and after a week or two, a month or two, a year or two, it becomes like it's easy. You just know how to do things. Are right? you kicking ass? The same thing in in Hollywood. Um. From the outside, it looks like oh, it's 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 you know it's glamorous and think it's not as glamorous as people think think it is. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of hustling, and it is not fun when it's two in the morning and I'm covered in blood and there's blood down freaking my underwear and down my butt crack and in my crotch and I'm freezing my ass off and I have a tank top <laughs> on and I'm supposed to look freaking yoked, you know, buff and you know whatever all these things. Some of that stuff's not fun, man. It's not fun. You know, oh, yeah, man. I get paid pretty well and things like that. But look, look, trust me, it's like an iceberg. You only see the top of the iceberg, right? You see that part. There's a whole part underneath that you never see. And it's a lot bigger. And that's where all the hard work comes from. And that's right. where all the comes from and the rejection and being told, no, you're not good enough. I, I went on one audition when I first started and the cast director asked me when I got done reading for a commercial. She says, hey, so. Uh, Michael, do you have another job? I said, yeah, I have a, I have this other job. It's a computer job. She goes, oh, it's pretty good. You should probably should keep that. And I walked out being naive as I was saying, oh, wait, she just freaking insulted me because she, I suck so bad at, at auditioning that she, she says, you, you know, you should probably keep your real job. And so, but when anybody tells me no, or tells me I can't do something or I'm not good enough, that just pisses me off and it makes me want to work harder. And I've always been like that, no matter what it is. So, yeah. Mm, so, but, but, but getting into acting and things after when you when you get into the process, you get into doing this every day. You you know, you know how it works. You know how the system works. Mm -hmm. and you, from there, you just work on just being trying to be great and trying to get through that. Through that, you know, it, it brings me back to a lot of things that I've been through in my life. So I understand. You know, when you told no, you can't do something. You're not good enough. It makes you want to just push. It makes you want to just go crazy, go at it because you heard those no's, you heard those rejections, and you have people in your ear telling you you can't do something. And that yeah. that's that 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 really, that really I really understand that, you know. Yeah, but, to me, that's the beauty of America, man. I really I don't think I've been all over the world, and I've seen you know I've been and I've I've been at some pretty some great places is pretty shitty places where you've seen some just desperate po poverty and just people, there's no way they can ever pull themselves out of it. But mm -hmm. the one thing I think in America, I think everybody has, at least you want to think that everybody has a chance to, to do great and, and to build a, a great family, a great you know career in life. I think, you know, there's, there's possibilities. If anybody tells you, no, uh, you know, tell them to freaking fuck off and I'm going to show you, you know, that's what you do. Right. Tell them, fuck you. I'll show you what happens. And, th and that's what I do all the time. So trust me, I get told all no all the time. So it's all good, though. 
Right, right. So you've been in Hollywood, right? Have you have do people come up to you and 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 be like, Oh, you're the guy that was in this movie, you was the guy in that movie. Do people come up to you like that? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I get that. But not you know, most it's like uh it's more about like especially in the airport, I get people staring at me and they'll go, Have we met before? You know, whatever. And it's like you like you look familiar. And then my line is always, Well, we might not have met before, but I've been in your living room. And they're like, what? I said, on your TV. So, you know, because people didn't, because once you meet me and things like that, they'll also know watch TV and go, hey, that's the guy we just saw at the airport or whatever, because I'm always on TV doing something crazy. So, yeah. yeah. So what was it like doing, um, <laughs> what was it like doing a Mr. Clean uh, uh, gig? Oh, it's good. Good. So I just got off the plane. I was, I just finished a Von Damme film called In Hell. And I was like jet lagged or whatever. And my manager calls me as I'm riding home. She goes, Hey, I know you just got back from Bulgaria. I was in Bulgaria like for three months doing this film. And she goes, but I have this audition for you for Mr. Clean. I'm like, what? Like a movie? She goes, no, to be the spokesmodel. I'm like, okay. And so I went in and the moment I walked in, they went, everybody's like, Oh my gosh, you're perfect. I'm like, okay. And so that I had to stand there and go, keep it a clean with Mr. Clean, you know, whatever did the whole situation. And, I ended up getting it. So I did it for six months. Um, I could have done it longer. They wanted me to stay longer, but it wasn't really acting. You know, I was was not really, it's not what I wanted to do because it took away from the whole acting thing. It was nice. I got to meet a lot. Of, I met Richard Petty, you know, the famous race car driver and a bunch of other race car drivers and things like that. It was really nice. I was down in the Daytona 500. I was in the pit with the Daytona 500, the race car and and saw all that. It was it was really cool and special and they took care of me and I got paid well and things like that, but I, it's not what I wanted to do. So. Oh man. So out of all the movies that you've done, man, what is the most memorable? Oosh. Uh, uh, let me see. Mm. There's, there's some really good, good moments. I've worked with some great people, man. Just, you know, there's some actors I've worked with that are, they're huge stars, you know, um, like Charlton Heston. I got to work with him in a movie called uh, Town and Country. And just a super, super nice guy, gracious. I've been a big fan of his because of, you know, from movies like Ben-Hur and he played Moses, you know, just, you know, he's a, a legend, right? And I'm I'm into watching old movies and things like that. And so he's, he's really, uh, he was great. Um, and then there's other people like, I got to work with Bing Rames and, and, uh, in a movie called In Hell, no, uh, Undisputed, with Bing Rames, was a Snipes. Bing Rames is just a phenomenal person, super nice. He's an actor's actor. There's actors that, because of their status, they won't do like off camera stuff. I don't know if you know what that means, being off camera. So, like if like if there's a shot and you see a close up on somebody, they'll put the camera over the other actor's shoulder to shoot the close up on him. Well, it's you're supposed to as an actor. If you're not on camera, you're supposed to still act with that other actor, right? Give him the dialogue so he can he can react off you. But there's actors that I work with that don't do off camera. So they'll get a stand in to come in there, their double or their stand in to come in there and say dialogue. Well, it's not it's not the actor that I'm working with, you know. And so right. that's always disappointing. But Ving Rames, he's there 24-7. He's there. He's a oh, cool, wow. cool dude. It's like what you and I were talking before about uh, before the show started. So they're like an undisputed. Um, there's the latrine, uh, the bathroom or latrine scene and in the dialogue. I'm supposed to call him the N word. Right. And I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't ever want to say that word. And um, uh, it's in the dialogue, though. And I have to say it. And. I walked up to him for the scene. I go, Hey, Ving, I said, and uh, I said, you know, I, I got to say this, you know, I uh, hope you don't knock me out for for real. And he's like, no, man, he goes, it's all, it's all good. You know, we're, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the script. And I said, I really don't want to say this. He goes, it's okay. It's fine. So I'm, I'm still kind of worried about it. I'm nervous about it. I'm like, damn, I don't want to say this word. You know, I have other dialogue too, but that part I have to say there. And, and, uh, I'm, I go, and then I go up to the director. I'm ready to tell him. He goes, hey, the director goes, hey, Michael, so we're going to cut that line there because we really don't need it. I Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
it's like for me, there's there's certain words that I don't like to say. Like another one is, you know, I'm I'm a I try to think of myself as a, a Christian as much as I can, and I'm not a, the greatest one. But uh, like words like God damn it or Jesus Christ, I have a tough time saying those words. I've asked for most of the time, can I not say that and say something else? You know, not like darn it, but, you know, just change it like just something else. Because to me, in my crazy mind, dropping the F-bomb or something like that, to me, that's those are uh, man's words. But when you say God damn it or Jesus Christ in vain, that's I think you're messing with the wrong people. So. <laughs> You know, that's for you, that's for you, man. That's for you. Yeah, so, so anyway, my craziness. Right. <laughs> so, you know, like, how do you prepare for your roles? Yeah, it depends on you know, which what kind. It's like sitcoms, of course. You know, it's. Uh, I have to tell you, sitcom actors are brilliant actors. There's are I've worked with some really great ones, and they have so much dialogue to learn in a very short period of time. And most of them are very, very spontaneous and quick-witted and you can change on a dime. And I've noticed like a lot of film actors, there's ones that are great professionals. A lot of them are come on drunk or sloppy or whatever. I've, I've, I've worked with, with actors who have actually passed out on the set because they were just drunk or wasted. You know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it depends, you know, like if I wanted the, when I had the movie called the Hills have eyes, I played a character named Pluto, uh, for that character, um, you know, I had to get in a different type of space. So it was extremely violent. And so I just got, I, I just, I got like kind of same attitude I did when I was playing football. I put that helmet on, man. I am nobody's friend. I'm going to freaking rip your head off. And that's, that's how I played that. You just, just don't get around me and just let me do my thing. I'm very controlled, but that's what I do. And then there's other times uh, I try to be, I quote as method as possible. I want to live in that character as much as I can because I think it really comes off that way. It's good. So, yeah. So when you were doing the Hills Have Eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what was it like? What was it like, you know, having all that makeup on your face? Yeah, it's it's, a, it's called prosthetics and they're pieces that are glued to your face. And the, the, the best in the business is the company called KMB. It stands for mm, uh, Greg Nicotero, uh, Jeff Berger, and not Jeff Berger, but uh, a Berger, and there's one guy in the front. But it's K and B. He uh, so Greg, Greg Nicotero was the guy who did all the prosthetics work for me for Hills of Eyes. He did a couple of shows where I got to work with him on. Great guy, and uh, so you're always the first one there because it takes about three to four hours to get on, and you're the last one who leaves. It takes about maybe an hour and a half to two hours to get off. And so you're, you're on it, you're in it all day. And so if you're, you know, my, if you're a little claustrophobic, uh, it might bother you a little bit, but it doesn't bother me at all. And I like it because it kind of cocoons you in this, in this world. And you look in the mirror and things like that, you're this character. It doesn't take much to become that character when you look like them. So I kind of like it. It's pretty good. Wow. Wow. So, when you found out that you had this role, what was your reaction? What was your feeling? Oh man, it was it was great. First of all, I got I knew I was going to go to Morocco and film, so we shot that in Morocco for like almost three months, so two two months, a little over two months, and so it was great. Uh, and plus, you know, it's from it's a remake of the original iconic you know original, and Michael Berryman played uh, it originally, and so it was an honor to be able to do that. Now, before that film, the director told us, Alex Aja said, do not watch the original. I want you to come in uh, with um, your own take. And so that's what I did. And so, uh, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was hot. It was like 120 every day, it's like Vegas heat. And uh, yeah, it was good. I had a, and I, it's one of the movies I won an award for. So it was good. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> man. So, what was the most darkest days of, of being on set? Hmm. Uh, I think the most difficult sometimes. There's sometimes that when you're doing a role, you just struggle. You just struggle with it. You do. Um, there are some roles where you know deep down inside as an actor, it just fits. 
like there's movies that I've done, like The Hills of Eyes, or maybe like I did a, a guest star, a couple, uh, I did recurring characters on like Nash Bridges, and other movie, other movies where I've I've done in TV shows where the role just fits. I, I just, it's just fun and I'm not doing anything. There's other ones where I'm struggling, man. I'm struggling to know the dialogue. I'm not hitting the beats right. I'm just, and that's, those, those are, those are the hard times because you know that on every time the camera rolls, there's thousands of dollars and millions of dollars sometimes waiting for you, waiting on you to, you know, depending on you to execute, perform, do a performance that you're supposed to. And when you're struggling, man, you feel bad. You feel bad sometimes. So, yeah. So, but that other than that, I mean, and there's also times dark, I think dark days sometimes are, are happen when you, you audition for a movie or a role and you know, you did great. You're perfect for it and you don't get it. And they go with a, with a quote, a name or something else, you know, someone bigger, bigger than you. And that, that always, that always bothers you. This day still bothers me on some roles. Like you remember the TV a movie called Scorpion King it was The Rock's first movie. Mm -hmm. So there's a character in that movie that I was supposed to get. So I read for it. They loved me. Uh, they had me ride a horse. They they had all this stuff. Everybody. Uh, it was in the middle of doing the movie Undisputed with Bing Rams, Wazzy Snipes, and the same crew that was doing that movie is going to work on Scorpion King. So when I I auditioned for Scorpion King in the middle of doing this film of doing Undisputed. When I came back to the set from auditioning, because we shot Undisputed in Vegas, so I had to go to Hollywood and read for this film. When I came back, they all knew that I got this role. They were all happy. They were there. They were everything was getting set up. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I didn't get the role. Come to find out, Arnold Schwarzenegger made a call to the director and said, "Can you put my? I went and need to put. He, he was friends with the director and says, put my buddy." Ralph Mueller in the role. So he had, Ralph Mueller ended up getting the role and I didn't. But I still wow. get but I still get money for it. I don't know why. I still get a residual check for Scorpion King. And I wasn't even in the damn thing. So whatever. So I was wow. probably on the call sheet or something. I don't know. But anyway, I just didn't. Um yeah. So that that stuff stuff like that bothers you, you know. So So what was your lowest um what was your lowest paying gig? Well, I've done free. That's pretty low. <laughs> I and, feel you. Know, and 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 I've done where I had to pay them money. So that's even lower. <laughs> you know, oh wow. But you know what? It's okay though. Um, because you know, it's like anything, right? If you want to get started in the business, like right now, you're doing this podcast for free. No one's paying you, right? Maybe mm -hmm. someday it'd be like Joe Rogan, right? To where he gets paid millions and millions of dollars. But you gotta put your dues in, right? And same thing as an actor. A lot at the beginning, you gotta do stuff for free. Right, you do, right. You got to hustle. Like t I think right. in today's society, sometimes everybody wants to like get paid like six figures for everything. I said, dude, no, you know, you got to put your work in, man. You got to pay your dues a little bit. You know, rarely, rarely does anybody walk into Hollywood, get spotted, you know, sitting on a park bench, going, "Hey, you're going to be in my next movie," and all of a sudden they're a big movie star. No, everybody that rarely, rarely, rarely ever happens. Normally, it's the person who. Who is basically um, he's, he busts his ass in class every night at acting class. He's you know he's working tables or whatever he's doing. He's hustling, doing whatever, and then he just works his way up. You know that's how it does it. That's how they do it. So yeah, so very true, very true, very true. So you being a you know a great great actor, who are some of the most notable other actors that you've acted in movies with yeah uh um let me see why well, like i mentioned charlton heston i think he was great uh i got to work with warren Beatty a little bit he was he was really super nice uh funny um uh drew carey uh from the drew carey show he had a sitcom they did it was really funny uh gosh urkel um you know uh forgot it i can't as, but he he's he's a great actor. Um, let me see. Bing Ring Rames and Wesley Snipes are, are good. I got to work with those guys. Uh, I don't know. Just oh gosh, there's been so many people. I have to go through my resume to figure out who who all I work with. But just I've been very blessed with a ton of people that I work with. That have been super talented, 
super nice to me. Uh, yeah, I just been, I've been, I've been blessed, man. And I think that's, that's part of it, right? If you're a good dude and you're easy to work with, and you're not a pain in the ass that people are going to remember you. And if you do good right. work, they're going to say, Hey, you know, that's, I like my, I have two sons. Um, both of them are playing uh, college football. So my older, older one plays at central Michigan. And, uh, and then my younger one, he's, he was playing for a junior college in California and he hurt his back and he's not going to play this year. So he went to got and he went to get a, like a seasonal job working at a, uh, this uh, Halloween store, you know, for Halloween. So he was doing this stuff. And, and I said, listen, this is a great opportunity for you to, to, cause I always tell them, you know, there's, I have these rules that we have. I always, I always tell these rules. And the first rule is that I'm a freaking I forget, forget the rules now, but anyway, so my first rule is that no matter what you do, right. You give it everything you got. I don't care what kind of job it is. You don't do anything half-ass, period. Because right. a half-ass is a reflection on you personally and your family. I mean, you wasn't raised right, right? So do everything Do everything to the best of your ability. And just give a little more if you can. You don't have to kiss ass. But just give a little bit more. But if you do that, people will recognize that. Because most people in this world go through the world being average, right? That's why the word... In the dictionary, average exists because most people are average. They're going to do live an average life, get an average job, and do average stuff for the rest of their life. They can't wait for the clock to turn five to then go home, and then drink, you know, drink and freaking get crazy and do whatever. That's what they live for. But if you do a little bit more each day uh, to put a little more effort into it and bust your ass, people are going to recognize that. And guess what's going to happen? That that manager, that boss is to go, you know, that dude's a good worker. I need him for something else. Next thing you know, you got promoted. Or next thing you know, you, you, you're being in a different type of opportunity. And so I said, that's the first thing is always do the best you can do. It doesn't have to be the, you know, just do the best in your ability. You don't have to be the best, but give your best. The second yeah. thing is, is that opportunities. So throughout your life, you're going to be presented opportunities. And there's two types of people. There's the one that's going to set back, too afraid to do anything, and let someone else step forward and take that opportunity. As long as you're not a drug dealer or in porn or, you know, do anything else where that opportunity happens, take it, right? Step forward. And my, my older son, who's at Central, before that, he was an Army Ranger in the 75th Ranger Regiment, a special operations guy, been deployed multiple times, badass dude. Um, and that's what he did in the military. He got he got tremendous opportunities from stepping up and taking those opportunities. And that's what you have to do in life. If, if I would have went to that audition with my friend and when they asked me to audition, I would have said no. I would have never had the career I had. But I said, screw it. I'm going to put myself out there and do it. And the third thing is don't be afraid to fail. You learn from failure. It's like football, right? If you're winning all the time in football, you're eventually going to get your ass kicked because what's going to happen is start getting complacent. And that's what happens to most people, right? Mm -hmm. If you're failing, you set back, you look, why did I fail? Why did, why did I not, why not win that game? When you fail, like in Silicon Valley, they have two words. The first one is winning. You're either winning or you're learning. There's no failure because it, when you don't succeed at something, you just learn how to do it better next time and try again. And that's basically the rules that I have and they always work. And that's how I live my life is that I'm not afraid. I don't care if you tell me no. I don't care if I fail. I'm going to keep doing it. So, and every day, do something big or small towards your goal. Like right now, you mm -hmm. and I are on this podcast. This is great. But every next tomorrow, you could be doing something else, right? Mm -hmm. How can I make this bigger? How, how can I get to more, reach more people? There's got to be a way. There has to be a way to do that. And so every day, right. you've got a way to do that. And that's what I do every day. So, Every day, man, man. So, do you do any rituals like, 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 um, uh, do something to get yourself ready for roles before you go do the roles? Yeah, I normally would scream, like, uh, I get a little, little crazy, you know, and gets my energy going. And then I'll say some bad words too, like, I'll say, fuck, like, fuck, you know, whatever, really loud or something like that. Depends if it's a fight scene, like when I fought Jean Claude Van Damme, I would always right before 
right? Big fights and I would freaking get pissed and like, because what I do is that, I, you know, I work on rehearsing, you know, fights, maybe, maybe, you know, whatever the fights. And then from there, because I'm a pretty good martial artist, I'm a pretty good fighter. And so I've trained quite a bit. And so, uh, but then after you get all the choreography, you know, choreography down and you know how, how the scene's going to go, from there, you just let it all go and you get in, you get emotionally into it. And just I just let out a big scream and then I'm good, man. I'm good. So, so um, Jean-Claude Van Damme, basically, you know, was he was he good to work with? He was. He was a hard worker. Uh, he was a hard worker. Yeah, he, he was. He was a good dude. Yeah, I'm not gonna say. Oh wow. Good. Yeah, he was. He was a good dude. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, I have stories <laughs> that we could tell over beers, but not right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so who was the who was the the who are the the hardest people are actors and actresses to work with? I've, I'm not going to mention any names, of course, but I, I, no, 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 no. Yeah, but there, there are people, a few actresses that I work with that had serious attitudes when I introduced myself to them. And then they found out that and as we worked together, they realized, oh, he, he's a pretty good actor. And then, then their attitude changed towards me. I'm like, why were you nice to me at the beginning? Why do you have to be like a, you know, not very nice person, you know, just whatever. So anyway, yeah. And same thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. You just got to prove yourself. And then, again, it's all about being a great to work with. And it's like in any job. If you're paying the ass showing up, guess what? Your boss is not going to want to, the guys are paying the ass. They're going to figure out a way to get rid of you or not invite you back or something like that. But if you're a great, great dude, do you work? You're easy to work with. You're fun. Dude, you, you the whole world opened up, opens up to you. And that's what happens in life. Yeah. That's what happens. That's crazy. It's true. Though. It's true. It's yeah, true. very true. Very it's true. true. And it's, it's true. If if people like treat you like shit, or you know, I I this is I'm still learning. Like, listen, I'm 65. I just turned 65 a couple of days ago, and I still I'm still learning, and I'll learn till I I fall over. Um, like someone cuts you off, uh, or honks their horn, or flips you off, and things like that. I mean, inside, I want to go and beat the shit out of them, right? I want to freaking just ram my car into them and do whatever. But then I'm like, I need to let that all go. And I'm letting what they're doing, unless, unless they're freaking physically attacking me, you know, I let, most of them, I just let that shit go. Because what's it going to serve? I'm going to go and run them off the road, pull them out of the car, beat the shit out of them. All, all I'm going to do is end up in jail, right? And it just makes, it serves no purpose. Make, make you feel good for about two seconds. And then the rest of it, you're going to feel like shit because you're going to be in jail. It's gonna be expensive, so um, so my it just for me I'm still learning that is to let that let let stuff go. If someone cuts me off, or someone like I go in a restaurant and the waitress is shitty, um, you know, to me whatever. Um, I'll say sometimes I'll say you know I you it looks like you're having a bad day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like when I used to coach football, right? So uh, I used to coach fo football back in California. Uh, and sometimes the ref and I was the head coach for a youth organization. And then whenever I'd coach my team, sometimes the refs, you know how those refs are sometimes they have attitudes mm -hmm. and you're questioning a call. They're like, they're, they're, sometimes they're like, uh, you know, they're, they seem like they're just calling, they're all, they call, you know, they make all these calls against your team. And I, what I do, the trick is to walk up and say, you know what? I feel like you don't personally like me have i have i done something to offend you you know whatever and then they get all defensive no no everything's good so i diffuse the whole night situation so anyway <laughs> so you know you'd be in the being was you ever afraid on set to just like mess up or was you just it just came natural oh no uh it, nothing's natural it's it's not natural uh and so I think auditioning is probably the hardest thing because auditioning is like with on, on set, you won the role, right? So it's, you feel good about it. Um, and you feel confident because you beat everybody else up to get the role. But auditioning is when it's a, a ton of pressure there and you got a lot of, a lot of competition. You got the, the foyer, the room before you go in, you have like 20 other guys that look just like you. Right. And they're all, and they're all looking at you and looking each other up like, what's up, dude? You know, whatever. Give me a little head nod, like trying to intimidate you. You know, it's the same <laughs> thing when you're on the corner, right? It's the same thing. 
And then you look at you try to study your stuff. And I just walk in there and ignore everybody, you know. And uh, but yeah, it's, it's that's where the pressure comes from. And yeah, you you don't want. But this is what I learned. The same thing. I you know I get up and I have to speak sometimes in front of people. If I'm prepared enough, if I'm super prepared, um, I uh, I'm squared away. If if I'm super prepared, um, I'm not nervous. I just okay. Away. If you're prepared, that you should be good. So and that's that's what I learned. Okay, okay, okay. So, <clears throat> oh man. So, what are the places? What are the places that you've been to years in the years past during like, uh yeah, doing act? World. Yeah, like doing acting during your acting gigs. Yeah, so I've been like to Hong Kong. I uh, did a film there. Um, I did uh, films in uh, in Bangkok. Uh, films in northern part of Canada, uh, Jamaica, um, all th- of course, you know, throughout the United States, but then uh, in Mexico, uh, in uh, London, uh, France, uh, Germany, and northern part of Africa. So I, that's where I've been. So, yeah. I've been oh, here. Man. Yeah, yeah. So it's been good. It's been awesome places. Awesome places. I want to go man. again. I'll be an actor. It'd be nice just to go there and travel and visit. Yeah. Right. True. You know what I'm saying? Got to travel. You know what I mean? So, you know, how do you feel being at the age you are now? How do you feel about acting? Good. So, so my, my career as an actor, um, I am not doing it as regular as I used to. And that's on purpose. Uh, I have focused more on the writing side of things. Okay. So I've written a ton of screenplays because I've lived a pretty interesting life. I've been very blessed and fortunate, right? I've done a lot of cool stuff. And uh, it's not without, didn't, and this stuff didn't happen to me, just landed in my lap. I, I was presented with opportunities and I worked my ass off to try to be the best I could in everything that I did. Um, and so, uh, but right now I'm doing a ton of writing and I just had a screenplay option called my good boy. And so you always see these stories about some athlete who overcomes all these odds and wins the championship or super bowl or whatever. Right. You never hear about the guy who, uh, who basically blows his knee out and he's left with nothing. And that was me. So, oh, wow. yeah. So when you're left with nothing and you, you blow your knee out, what do you do? You go through depression. I was in Detroit, you know, I went back to Detroit area and I got in some trouble and, uh, some bad trouble. So I had dudes waiting for me on my car with the nines, you know, rested on their lap and I had to pull out my 45 and we're staring at each other. It's scary shit. You know, this That's is back wild. in the day. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I got done with that and I'm, my hands are on the steering wheel, my hands freaking shaking. So I'm not dying for this shit. You know, just, you know, I had dudes that wanted, that wanted to take me out, you know. And so it's that it's a lot of. So this is the story that I, you know, it's about that and how to how I got out of it. And yeah, so I've been, you know, shot and stabbed and seen, seen some bad stuff. So, you know, but it's all all good. I'm here. I'm still I'm still breathing. At least today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. Oh, man. So yeah. man, like you being a an actor and all, man. Who are your favorite? Who are some of your favorite actors? Uh, I like you know, as crazy as it seems. I like Tom Cruise. I've always liked him. Uh, maybe I don't like the Scientology part of it, but I I like him as an actor. I think he's brilliant because he can do straight up you know hero roles, roles and then he does something like you know th- uh, tr- uh, Tropic Thunder. He plays that crazy agent or a movie called rocket ages it's a musical where he plays this rock and roller dude he just appears in these crazy roles and i, I love someone like that uh, i um i've always liked denzel washington i i think that dude is a badass actor uh i always liked him uh I am seeing gosh. There's Liam Neeson. I, I like him. He's he's older. 
you know, I like, I like the stuff that he's done. Um, I don't know. I have to think about some other actors that I like, but just, there's a lot of greats, like other role, other, other actors I like, uh, that I've worked with that are just, uh, been really good. So, yeah, I, I just so, appreciate good work. <laughs> true that. True that. True that. So what do you think about the mute, the industry? Do you think it evolved or devolved? It depends on, it depends on, um, on what you mean as towards the business itself. I think it's evolving uh, to a certain extent. Uh, there's more, uh, you're, you're allowed to do a lot more cooler things with visual effects and things like that. And stories can be more fantastic. I do think okay. though, I think actors need to, I don't want to get in trouble here, but I, I, I'm always disappointed when I hear actors expressing a political opinion sometimes. I know everybody has their right to do that, but your job is to entertain. And when you piss off half the country, you know, because of a, a political opinion, I think that's almost like suicide to a certain extent. And I, I mean, that's towards career suicide. I just think that's, I think, I, I really think that we need to, to cool out. You know, that bothers me a little bit. I think we all need to, Dude, man, we're we're we're, li we're living in the best country in the world, and you know, I, I you know, compared to others, I think we've got a great opportunity, and I think there's so many cool things that we could do. Let's you know, let's let let's figure out the the cure for cancer. Let's figure out poverty. You know, let's let's freaking up uplift people. You know, let's do that. Let's take care of our own country. I, and I truly believe that. I think I want to help people out. So, I was uh, one of my goals is in life is to um, so I was. Uh, so my mom was my mom. My dad adopted me and I didn't find out until I was 16. And so I came, my, my, I guess, biological father was, was not a very good dude. And I'm very blessed that I have, you know, I have a, I had a father who, who raised me. Right. Um, and I, but I was here too, like in, uh, in homes, uh, youth homes, kids will age out. Like when they're 18, right. They're, they're let go. What do those kids do? I want to help those kids. So my goal is someday to be able to provide that type of help to those types of kids to, to kind of steer them in the right direction. So that's one of my goals. Cool. Very yeah. awesome. You know, I mean, you got to have a backup plan. If you got to have something to whenever you retire, you know what I'm saying? And that's a good, that's a good goal. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't plan on returning anytime soon. So I'm going to, I'm going to ride it hard to the end. So that's, that's <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. You know, I mean, so, you know, when it comes to the business side, do you hate doing the business side or do you love doing the business side of, of the industry? So that's why you have managers and agents, right? They're the ones that handle all the contracts and the negotiation and things like that. So they'll, they'll always make sure you get your approval, but I, I don't handle that portion of it. I mean, there's something that I'm not going to do, you know, there's something that, that kind of is against my morals, you know, then that's something where I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So. Um, true. Very true. So, okay. I got another good question. Got another good question. So, okay. What are the roles that you want to play that you that that's on your bucket list that you just got to oh, do it? I, I want to my first one is I want to play the, the main villain in a James Bond film. Like, you know, I want to be that guy. So ball headed, scary dude. That's like, you know, just goes around killing people. I would love to be in a James Bond film. The, the, the villain. That's what I want. Like the right hand man to not to the, the to the main bad guy. That's what I want. True, true. A lot of my burping, man. It's killing me. <laughs> um, oof. So, you know, you're such a big character, you know, a big guy in the industry, man. How come you're not being, you haven't been notar notarized like most of these other other actors are like, you like did like, some of them. Like, 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 like gotten like been doing the big movies, the huge movies and things like that. So I haven't. Yeah. I, yeah. Like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, 
you know, it's just, I think some of it has to do with just being able to get that type of opportunity. And I haven't, and I that I haven't had that. So, but that's okay. I'm considered what you call a working actor. So I go from gig to gig, you know, and that's what I do movie to movie, TV show to TV show, commercial to commercial, and I make a living at it. And that's what I do. So, and I'm pretty good at playing bad guys. You know, I've played, you know, bad guys in comedies to, you know, to, films to everything, TV shows, all that stuff like that. I've always been the comic foil sometimes, you know. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been, it's been a good career. So I've been, I'm not, I don't, I don't uh, sit in my room going, you know, woe is me and uh, why didn't I get my big break? You know, I, I'm very blessed with what the opportunities I've had. So it's all good. So who are the, some of the mentors in your, in your life that, has mentored you in in the in the acting business yeah so i mean just personally i think my my parents my mom and dad they're in their 80s and to this day i still rely on them for advice uh you know they'll always be your parents right and so they've lived they've managed to live longer than you know me of course and lived through a lot of craziness and so them uh you know, I, I think that's one of the, the main mentors is that um, just I have friends of mine that I look up to that I, you know, ask advice for and things like that. So I have good friends of mine that I, that I do, but I'm an old dude, so I should be a mentor. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, if, if you if, if you feel that, you, you know, you want to, you know, because I think that, you know, if you have knowledge to give somebody, why not give it to them? You know what I'm saying? Why not share it with them? I agree. You know. Because knowledge is power to anybody that yeah. wants it. Yeah, you agreed. know, agreed. And you know, if you're if you're out for the good for the for the, for the good of people, why not share your knowledge and, and yeah. share your, you know, what I mean, yeah. what you know to yeah. help people? Because yeah. nowadays, a lot of these kids out here don't have people like you or people that want to help them, people that want to see them grow, people that want to see them happy. You know what I mean? Nowadays, people hate they hate more than they love. Yeah, now, there's really much not that love has grown cold in, in this world. You know what I mean? And, I have to tell you a funny story. So uh, doing a lot of traveling and things like that, I, you know, I, one of the things that I would do for one of my younger sons, I would, everywhere I'd go, I'd always buy my son, uh, I try to get my son a jersey from the fo football team that in that city I was in. So I was in Baltimore uh, a few years ago, and uh, my son wanted a jersey of I forgot the quarterback. What's the quarterback's name at Baltimore? Lamar Jackson. Yeah, Lamar Jackson's jersey, number two, I think. So one, and so I, I I'm in Baltimore. I go to the stadium. There's no pro shop there at the stadium. I'm like, what oh, the wow. hell? And so, um, uh, and so I'm like, well, I don't know, I was at a gas station and these two dudes, these two dudes, you know, um, walk by, it's two black guys, walk by young dudes and they walk, they're walking up and I go, and I, and I say, Hey man, do you know where a pro shop's at? He goes, nah, they don't have one here. And I says, he goes, but, uh, we, we can show you where, you know, maybe go downtown. I said, all right. So. I, we, I got him in the car and we were, we were driving cool dudes, young guys, you know, um, and, uh, they're probably like in the early twenties and we got out and they showed me the pro shop and it was, it was so funny. Uh, I bought, I bought a shirt. I said, you know what? I said, you guys are really cool. I said, uh, how about this? I said, how about I take you guys to lunch? It was the funniest thing. We were sitting, eating a lunch. We were just eating at McDonald's. I was outside in McDonald's. So the open area area and, and, uh, it was a nice day too. We're sitting there and having and we're talking about life and we're talking about like what their goals are. And that. All the time I'm always talking to people about goals. I'd like to like to motivate people. I'm very blessed with what's happened to me. Right. And I truly believe that, you know, this might be as this might be very wishful thinking or maybe I'm living in fairyland or la la land or whatever. But I always think that everybody has the potential to be great. I really do. No matter yeah. where they're from, no matter what life you know, life has presented them. I think they have a chance to pull themselves out of it one way. That's maybe I'm switchful thinking or I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, fairy tale. 
But anyway, um, I was talking to them. We were talking about their goals and their dreams and things like that. And the whole time they were getting their freaking phones were blowing up. All their girlfriends and friends are going, hey, what are you doing with that white dude? What, what's that white dude doing? <laughs> like that old white dude. Why are you talking to that old white dude? And that was the funniest thing ever. Um, I, I loved it. I loved every bit of it because I love I love helping people, man. I do, and and uh, and to this day, for well, quite some time, we 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 continue to talk, and and uh, then that kind of went away. But um, yeah, it's good good do. I I love I love talking to people. Uh, I'm in an Uber uh, with a driver. I'm always asking him, you know, do you pl- this is what you plan to do for the rest of your life? You know, let's let's talk. What do you want to do? You know, and so I I communicate with people. I've gotten like two or three people started in Hollywood that have asked me to help them. So it's been, uh, it's been good. I have a question. Some, I have a question. You were a bit, you were pretty big in inhale. What was your training like? Yeah. So twofold. One is at the time I was training at gold's gym in Venice. So I was, I was doing a lot of bodybuilding type stuff. So I weighed 275 there. So I was a big dude. Um, I think I have a, do I have a picture of that? I don't know. I have a picture of that. Um, but anyway, so uh, my phone, I can show you. 275, I did two, two types of training, bodybuilding and then uh, and worked out hard. And then I also trained uh, MMA, uh, ground fighting with uh, the Muchados. Uh, they had a they had an office or a, they had a place in um, in Santa Monica. I would go there and train. I trained for a couple months before I, would, before I did that, that, that gig. So that's that's what I did. And it's funny too, because I wasn't really supposed to start working. I'm trying to find this picture. I'm sorry for that. Um, or right, here it is. That's the picture right there. That's me right there. So middle of the fight scene. So um, so that's uh, I was gonna say is that uh, I was I wasn't supposed to because I, I they filmed this in Bulgaria. So uh, when I got there, I wasn't supposed to film for a couple of days. The moment the director saw me, he goes, "You're working tomorrow." We're putting you to work right now, and that's that's what happened. So it's good. I actually played two roles in that that film. I played that character named Balia, then the then this other character, the guy in the mask in the movie, uh, the guy who's played that character broke his ankle, so he couldn't play that role anymore. So they put stilts on my boots, and I played this other character. So I was six four. They put like three inch stilts on the on the on the heels. And I played the character in the mask. So yeah, it was fun. Oh wow. Yeah. So how, how did you walk on the stilts? It was just all there's just this big this heels. That's all. That's all they were. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So like, were they like those? Um, was was they like, like high to where you couldn't walk in them, or were they, were they were like? They're just just big old. It's like big thick heels. You've seen like like short girls with the, with the big old heels. They wear like the big old tennis shoes with the thick heels. It's kind of like that, but it was like three or four inches they're really tall so like maybe, stilettos basically yeah yeah but yeah but just a full solid heel across so yeah so i did fight okay. scenes in that i picked a dude up in the air and slammed him with all that stuff on yeah so it was pretty oh good. wow yeah. wow so that being being that big man like was with was would it ever slow you down or you can move fast so still with me? so every I can understand that i played professional you know i was i got as far as you know, the Dallas Cowboys. I didn't get there because I was some big goof. You know, I'm fast and I'm quick, you know, and it's funny. There's a guy um, that was one of the, we had a role in the film. He was a European guy. He was the first European, I guess, to be a uh, uh, Muay Thai uh, boxing championship. And after the first fight scene, he comes up to me and he goes, Michael, I will make you, give me six months. I make you world champion. Cause he, I can move fast, you know, and I, and I'm a pretty good fighter. So all that together, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So but yeah, all good stuff. Oh, wow, man. Yeah. Man, you have had a great life. <laughs> it's been good, man. So it's good. I, and I don't take it for granted. And I'm to this day, I'm still, I have big dreams, man. I want to, I want to win an award. I want to win an Academy Award as a writer. That's my goal. Uh, I want to, I, I have a, I own part of a company, uh, a startup, a tech company that that I work for, and uh, I do that um, as well. And uh, 
my goal, I'm 65. I plan on working till I'm 72 or in my seventies, as long as people can have me and I'm still functioning. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going at it, man. I'm not going to quit. So most people will start thinking about retirement and I have, that's the last thing in my mind right now. I love, hey, I love making money. I love working. I love, I love being successful. I love working to be successful. I like, I like hard work. I'm still working out of the gym six days a week. So I still have abs at 65, which is not too bad. So. Yeah. Wow. Dude, like that's like, how do you keep your body in shape? Like what kind of sets and training you do daily? So mostly, and I, you know, I, I competed in bodybuilding uh, as well. And uh, 60% of anything is diet. So it's, it's what you put in your body, right? Your body's an engine, right? And so if you're putting junk in your body or in your engine, guess what? You're going to get junk out. And so, so uh, I do intermittent fasting. So I stop eating around between five and six. And I don't eat again until like 12 or one. That's normally what I do. And then uh, I try to eat lean as much as I can. I try to cut down my carbs. I don't have as many carbs. Hey, listen, you have junk days or sometimes you have three or four days where you just go on a binge and want to go to Burger King or whatever, right? Um, I'll do that. So, But uh, I try to eat fairly good. And just when you work out in the gym, I do six days a week. I only do like an hour a day. So I do about 20 minutes on with some cardio. And then I jump over and, and I get a good sweat going. Then I jump into doing... Uh, I do a split of push pull. So chest, shoulders, triceps one day, and next day is back and biceps, the next day is legs, and I repeat it. That's what I do. That's amazing, man. I'm still I'm trying to get I'm trying to get in shape, man. Maybe you could teach me a little something, something. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Hey man, shoot. I'm because I, I think that, you know, because do you feel good? You know what I'm saying? Physically, that you're in each? Physically yeah. Um, joint wise, I'm hurting. So my knees are bad. My shoulders are bad. Uh, my, they want to fuse my neck. They want to replace my shoulders and knees. And that's all from football. And, you know, being a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne. And then also, you know, I, I'm not a stunt guy, but I end up doing a lot of my own fight scenes, a lot of my own stunts. And so uh, all that together, you know, you do that for 40 or 50 years, you know, um, um, you have you have a question over here that yeah. somebody has want to ask you a question. Yeah, I, I agree. Eugenics has something to do with it, but you know, uh, but I also think too that just hard work, and you know, I think the the right type of diet. Listen, you have to have fun in life, right? You can't be eating nothing but celery for the rest of your life. That's boring, right? So, and but you got to have like maybe out of the seven days a week, maybe five to six days, you're going to be watching what you eat. You know, and then on that six, on that seventh day, go have a pizza, so, you know, go have some ice cream. Whatever. One day is not going to hurt you or one meal is not going to hurt you. But then if you're in the gym, it's all about consistency, too. If you keep doing it, being consistent, it'll eventually start paying off. It's like anything. If you want to be great as a writer, write every day. If you want to be a great podcaster, you got to be you got to podcast every day or at least as much as you can. Do it every day. Right. You get better and better at it. It's like Kobe Bryant. Kobe, I'm one of the biggest fans of Kobe Bryant. Unfortunately, he's, you know, it's not around anymore. But he he was huge and he worked his ass off. I mean, he shot thousands, of, you know, 10,000 shots, you know, thousands of shots before a game and after a game and all those things like that. And to be great, that's what you have to do. You have to put it in work. You just can't show up and be great. It doesn't work like Rarely does that happen. The, the streets are lined. The streets are lined lined with people who are the greatest athletes in the world, but lazy because they didn't put the work in. They didn't, didn't put the work in. So if you apply yourself and you put some work into it, you could be anything. Listen, I, I was, I'm an okay actor, right? I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, Omo Sharif or anybody, some big fancy actor. I'm just, I'm, I, I just do a good job. You know, um, not a great actor, but I do a good job. Same thing in my, my regular jobs that I have in my writing. I work at it every day. My strive, my goal is to be great, but that's an everything, anything. You want to be a great, the greatest podcast in the world. I, one of the things that always fascinates me is I hear, hear a coach sometimes like, well, we just want to make the playoffs this year. Screw that. 
No, you want to win a championship this year. Anything less than a championship is, is failure. That's what you want to do. And so for me, if I'm going to take anything on, I want to be the best at what I do. I don't want to be right. the best. Right. If, if you're not going to want to be the best, then don't do it. Don't waste your right. time. Just, you know, yeah. be the best at everything you do. You know, and that just try to work at it. Trust me, if you work at trying to be the best and other opportunities will open up for you, that always happens. It always, trust me, it'll always happen. True that, true that, true that, you know. Do you believe that, you know, in the being an actor, are you, like, are you put in situations where you have to, you know, cry sometimes, where, yeah. like, every, oh, man. Like, I've done that. Yeah, I've done that. So, uh, yeah, you got to do it. So, it's all part of it. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't rarely get to do that, but yeah, I've done that. I've done scenes oh, where wow. I had to rape, I had to rape a girl twice, two movies. I had to rape, I had a, a simulation rape, but you know, whatever I had to do that. That, that to me is hard. I don't like doing that, but, um, what are was, some of the roles that you would not do? Uh, I have a, mm, uh, I had opportunity to, I have a tough time. I had, I had to kiss some guy and I didn't want to do that. So I just didn't want to do that. So I didn't want to audition for that role. So I had to play uh, a guy that was gay and I had to do, I had to kiss him and I just didn't, I wasn't going to audition for that. So uh, I'm just not going to do that. That kind of bothers me. I'm so if I'm a true actor, I should be able to do that. All right. But I just, uh, I don't know. I mean, hey, if it's against your morals, it's against your morals. That's how you feel, you know? Yeah. Me. And not not that I'm homophobic and like this and, and nothing like that. Just I just don't want to do that. So that's all. Hey, that's how you feel, you know? That's how you feel, you know? I mean, hey, you know what? I, you know, I wouldn't do those roles or anything, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it's, if, if, if you're not like that, you shouldn't take those roles, you know? But if you're out there just going for any old thing, you know what I mean? Just want to make it into the business and you're, you know, just take any old thing. You're bound to, like, have you ever been, have you ever walked into, like, uh, situations where you got messed over? Like, fucked over? Um, like that one thing I told you about Scorpion King, I guess that was, that was kind of a got, got screwed over, but that's part of the business and that's what happens. So, um, I was upset at the time, but now it's like, whatever. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I've had one of our movies that got shut down, uh, meaning they ran out of money. Um, I've had things like that. Uh, not really too much. It's been pretty straight. I've, I've kind of, you know, I've, I've been around the world enough to know, you know, I understand in Hollywood, every homecoming queen and king, every good looking guy, every buff dude, everybody that thinks or anything comes to Hollywood to try to make it. Along with that comes every dirt bag or piece of shit that comes to Hollywood too. What do they do? They take advantage of those people. So as long as you go there with, you know, your eyes wide open, you know, and trust but verify, you'll be okay. So if, if there's something that's too good to be true, it seems it's probably it's probably something behind that. So we got to be careful. So true, 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 true. But that's the thing in no. real life too, right? So like you get spam. Hey, you know, send click on this link and you get five million dollars. Yeah, I'm not doing that. So you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, I feel what you're saying, man. You know, um, how many years have you been acting? So it's been almost. Uh, 30 it's like 26 27 years so yeah wow do you ever do you ever do a celebration for every for the anniversary of you know from the beginning to no. where you are now no i don't no 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 oh man i i would be i'll be partying every chance every anniversary i get <laughs> no. i just want to keep working that's all and you know making the money so that's what i want to do i feel you i feel you man so <clears throat> Is there anything else you want to tell talk, talk, talk to the people? No, I'm good, man. I, I appreciate it. It's a great, it's a great conversation with you. I, I, uh, 
I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been good. Oh, and by the way, that's my girlfriend up there, Miss Page. So awesome. Yeah, awesome. So anyway, but uh, yeah, no, I'm uh, it's everything's been good and I, I'm blessed. And thank you for thinking about me and uh, thinking that uh, I'm big enough to have on your show. So I appreciate it. <laughs> so I have another, qu there's another question that somebody's asking. Okay. Uh, I met a lot of actors at cons. Where's your next appearance? All right. Sounds good. Uh, it'll be in monster mania. Uh, I will be there from the 11th of the, this in about two weeks. So next, no, actually next week. So uh, monster mania in Philadelphia. So I'll be there. Yeah. You know, I was thinking I should be, I should go to comic, I should go to cons and stuff like that, movie cons and stuff like that, yeah. and set up shop. You know what I'm saying? You should. <laughs> you should. Hey, there are no rules in this world. As long as you're polite and as long as you're gracious, you know, just go for it, man. That's all you need to do. And I, I think, thank uh, Keith T. Jim. That's a cool name, actually. Thanks. Thanks for asking those questions. I appreciate it. But yeah, my next appearance is going to be Monster Mania. So. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. man. In Philadelphia. So that's about uh, next week. Next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'll be there. Awesome. Awesome. I live right in New Jersey. So, yay. You never know. Hey, make it uh. <laughs> So, man, it's been good, man. It's thank been you. good. He said, thank you. Love your work. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. No, thank you. I appreciate it. So... Yeah, you know, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man, and yep. just gracing this just show with your presence. Uh, you know, I also also I'm having a a show, um, a hundred episode. That's a hundred episode of the In Your Face show, right? Yep. And we're going to be celebrating the hundredth episode, right? Yep. And I would like to have you on. It's going to be a show where everybody who's been on the show gets to come on the show. And it's going to be a revolving door. Everybody's going to be on there that's been on here. And I would love for you to come on and have fun with us. All right. So cool. Let me know when. And if it works out with my schedule, I'd love to do it. So thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because, uh, okay. yeah, man. Well, have a good, it's uh, be fun. good. Have a good Friday night. And thank you again for having me on your show. I appreciate it. And I, I definitely wish you all the best. And, and, uh, and uh, I know. You're a cool dude, and I think you're super talented, and I think you're going to be hugely successful. Just keep doing it. Well, thank you, thank you. Oh, I'll always remember you. You know, I may just do my own movies and have you as my, have you as maybe as in a role. You know, you never know. I like it. All right. <laughs> thank you, sir. Good talk. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Take care. Yes, sir. Oh. What? Yes, sir. What? Oh, hold on, hold on. I gotta take us out of here. I gotta take us out of here real quick, real quick. I gotta go do my intro before we go, before we go. Hey, it's been well, y'all. Yo, yo, it's been love. Thank y'all for watching. And it's been an in your face show. And we out. Peace. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Always. All right. All right take care.